Before we begin, I want to make sure everyone understands that I recognize how sensitive of a topic this is to a lot of students. Either themselves, a close friend, or a family member has either been diagnosed with cancer, maybe recovering from cancer, or is cured from cancer. That's just downright scary how common cancer is. So today, my goal is to give students a broad understanding of cancer and the management of a cancer patient's care, rather than teach students about how to care for each specific type of cancer. My background is actually very heavy in oncology nursing. That's the place that I worked the longest in before I became a nurse educator. What I liked about oncology nursing is that the nursing care had to be holistic. There was low patient turnover, meaning I had the same patients for pretty much the whole shift. There was lots of details, long storylines, lots of education, and the patients are actually very loyal to their doctors. And I like that and I got to see the patient again and again and again. So there is a high amount of bonding that you're actually going to do. There are a lot of experienced nurses working on these units usually because they like that type of environment so they stick around for longer. There is a little bit of a downside. Patients can be considered heavy as there's lots of symptoms to manage. They're very sick sometimes. And a nurse has to be able to work with patients who are going through all different stages of the grieving process. And you have to know how the disease is going to impact the body. Um, so they have a lot going on physically and mentally. Um, last little plug right here. I know it's shameless, isn't it? There is a lot of collaboration with the interdisciplinary team members and that to me was fun because the nurse gets to manage and coordinate the care between the different teams. I appreciated that. All right, so next to teaching nursing students, this is my favorite place to be. If you haven't picked up on that already, you now know. Okay, I put these objectives in this slide because students often report feeling overwhelmed in this chapter. It's heavy, I totally get it, but I want you to stay focused and hear what I have to say about each of these topics. Oh, also, have a calculator handy as we will need it for the second half of the slideshow. Let's just start with the general question. What is cancer? Well, the word comes from the Greek, meaning crab-like or creeping ulcer. If you were to look up oncology, it actually comes from the word onkos, which literally means swelling. So what we have here are some genetically unstable cells. This instability means that ever so slightly, the daughter cells do not look or function like the mother cells. These cells also have an invasion to apoptosis, which that's fancy for programmed cell death, and are essentially immortal. So we have a genetic damage or mutation, which the resultant changes in the cell's physiology that transform little bit by little bit into a cancerous one. Who has heard that famous phrase, um, about cancer and smoking causes lung cancer, but obviously that must be fake because grandma had smoked for years and she doesn't have cancer. Well, okay, so there is actually a multi-dimensional web of causes for cancer development and progression because you can have somebody who's never smoked a cigarette in their life and they have cancer at a young age. It's that complicated. I want to point out my heavy use of these interchangeable terms just so you know I'm saying the same thing. If I mention the word neoplasm, that also is the same word as cancer, it's the same word as tumor. Just to make sure we are all on the same page. One of the reasons we can develop cancer is because of gene expression. And in this case, I have a example of gene overactivity and gene underactivity. 
So in gene overactivity, I have this famous celebrity named Shannon Doherty. She is the actress in the Beverly Hills 90210 show. Let me point her out. She's right here. Okay. <laughs> in case you didn't know. So she actually tested positive for HER2 gene. Now that stands for human epidermal growth factor receptor. Once again, the HER2 gene. It makes HER2 proteins, which make up receptors on breast cells. Breast cells. Normally, the HER2 gene helps grow a healthy breast um, cell, and it's going to divide and repair itself. But if this gene mutates, like it did in her case, the HER2 gene makes too many copies of itself. In fact, we know this as HER2 gene amplification or overactivity. All of these extra HER2 genes tell the breast cell to make excessive amount of receptors, and this makes breast cells grow and divide in an uncontrollable way. Just FYI, not testable material, but just for your listening pleasure, about 30% of breast cancers are HER2 positive, and they have a very poor prognosis. And you'll see that they actually get a medication called Herceptin, which selectively binds to HER2 receptors. This is a huge breakthrough, guys, in HER2 positive breast cancer, as this is normally resistant to all types of therapy. Then what causes cancer is gene underactivity. One tumor suppressor gene is called the BRCA gene, the BRCA gene. These BRCA genes actually help repair damaged DNA, and this protects the cells from growing out of control and becoming cancerous. They are the quality control crew for breast and ovarian cells, I'd like to say. If we look to the right here, we see Anjali Jolie, and in her case, she tested positive for the significant mutations of the BRCA gene. Therefore, a non-functioning BRCA gene could let tumors develop and also fail to prevent other cancer-promoting uh, mutations. So she went ahead and prophylactically had her breast and her ovaries removed because she didn't have the protection of the BRCA gene. Just want to clarify in case anybody and everybody wants to go and get tested for the BRCA gene. Uh, we do have about 50% of the population has a defected BRCA gene. However, the doctor for Angelie Jolie says that her specific mutation carried an 87% risk of breast cancer and a 50% risk of ovarian cancer. Not to mention, she had previously lost her mother, grandmother, and aunt to cancer. So that's why she made the decision to go ahead and go forward with a uh, bilateral mastectomy and oophrectomy. Not all tumors are created equally lethal. Let's look at the words benign or malignant. By glancing at the chart, you would probably say that malignant tumors have the worst prognosis. And you are right. One way we know a malignant form of tumor versus a benign tumor is to look at the cell differentiation, meaning does the daughter cell look like the mother cell in function and structure? If it looks and acts kind of like mother cells, but not really, we say there is poor differentiation, meaning um, as an example, if I see a spot on someone's lungs and if we biopsied it, I would hope to find lung cells. If they barely look like lung cells, ugh, this means these group of cells are so far gone and so far mutated that it has poorly differentiated or is in the table here as we see less well differentiation or differentiated, excuse me. Y'all, <clears throat> if you see these words on a pathology report, please know this is bad, bad, bad. And these cells are like wild bulls in a china shop and can replicate and invade other organs like no one's business. So 
that is one way to know if this tumor is going to be benign or malignant because in benign tumors there is good differentiation or cells are well differentiated now let's look at another characteristic what if the doctor goes in to remove a brain tumor and comes out and says something like oh it had solid margins take a look at this chart do you think it is a benign tumor characteristic or malignant tumor right it's benign if a tumor is now compressing brain tissue due to its mutation characteristics um, but these bad cells are all closed up in a fibrous capsule this is actually a good thing <laughs> but <laughs> it's really weird to say that now malignant of course would be the opposite and doctors sometimes if they're going in there and, and they're exploring they can't tell where the bad tissue stops and the good tissue begins now if you look at the bottom malignant tumors can cause death because of their rapid growth and expansion compressing blood vessels causing ischemia and tissue injury and obstructing normally body functions this is not in the case of benign tumors however i have had a few patients with benign tumors and their colon and we are going to move pretty aggressively to get this benign tumor out of the way because we have obstruction of function however oftentimes benign tumors don't cause death let's dive a little bit deeper into malignant tumors we really have two types we have solid and hematologic solid tumors are actually going to originate in one organ and over time they're going to hop into a different one via the lymph system or the bloodstream we also have hematologic cancers this is where the blood cells and the lymph them uh, the lymph cells are actually the ones disseminating the disease they themselves are the bad ones the bad guys <clears throat> and this oftentimes is very widespread and our chemo is going to be a little bit more harsh and we're going to see more signs and symptoms of complications from the chemotherapy i want to point out this term called cancer in situ that basically means cancer in transit and if you look down at that picture we actually can see that we have some mildly dysplastic cells and we want to at this time in the cancer's development catch tumors when they are in situ reason being is they haven't involved any other layers of the body it's just the surface a quick uh, example would be our pap smears that we do on patients we are actually trying to capture through this screening process cancer in situ and if we do catch it we see all this dis Plasia going on and um, dysplasia hyperplasia if we see all these abnormal cell growth then we're going to usually burn it off or we can cut it out and hopefully not get to the invasive cancer type we have to stage the cancer or I should say the doctor has to do that we get to just go along with it <laughs> but what is staging staging is actually something we do which describes the severity of a person's cancer and it's based on the size and or extent of the original or primary tumor and whether or not it has spread throughout the body staging is really important for several reasons one it helps the doctor plan the appropriate treatment two it can be used to estimate a person's prognosis and knowing the stage of the cancer is really important for the identification of clinical trials that may actually be suitable treatment options for a patient it also really helps healthcare providers and researchers exchange information about patients just giving them that common terminology for evaluating results and evaluating if a patient is eligible for a clinical trial or not take a look at this this is what 
we can use as a tool to stage somebody's cancer. We call it the TNM system, and it is for solid tumors. So by looking at this, would you say that stage one tumors are metastasized? Hmm? How about stage two tumors? That's really hard to say. Stage two tumors. I want you to say it. Okay, how about stage three? Are those metastasized? And your answers, by the way, should be no, no, and no. Now stage four. The answer is yes. This means, by definition, metastasis. The tumor has moved from one organ to another, and this is not a good sign because if it has gotten into another organ, where else could it have gotten that we just haven't detected yet? If we look at leukemia, the hematologic cancer, this is really tricky because leukemia is wherever your blood goes. And where blood goes, that person has cancer. So we're actually going to not use the TNM system to stage leukemia. We're actually going to use a couple of different other factors, such as what is their current white blood cell or platelet level count? What is their age? because advanced age will actually negatively affect the prognosis. The older you are, the poorer the prognosis. Do you have a history of prior blood disorders? How about what are the exact chromosome mutations or abnorm abnormalities? What is the extent of the blood damage? Mm, let me rephrase that. What is the extent of the bone damage? Lastly, how enlarged is the liver or spleen? Based of off of all of those characteristics, they will actually then stage the leukemia. This is the oldest form of cancer treatment. You got something that's not supposed to be there? Well, cut it out. Let's look at the different types of surgery that we can do for somebody. There is prophylactic. This is where we're going to remove at-risk tissue, such as a polyp, maybe a cyst suspicious mole or we could possibly do say a pap smear and if we do notice cancer in situ we can um, initiate some cryotherapy and remove it that would be prophylaxis how about for diagnosis this is where we are going to do fine needle aspiration or maybe even exploratory surgery the next one is cure yeah, we actually can cut it out. This is useful if the tumor is confined to a space and maybe when they take it out, they notice that the margins are clear and now the lump is gone. You are cured. The next one is control. <clears throat> this type of surgery is also known as debulking or cytoreductive surgery. This decreases the number of cancer cells and the number of tumors that a person may have. We're reducing their tumor burden. This is a common procedure for somebody who has ovarian cancer. A lot of the pelvic organ organs will have tumors all over them. No, we can't tack out somebody's whole hip, but we can sure um, do a lot of removing of the affected tissue. <clears throat> all right. Next would be palliative or palliation surgery. This improves somebody's quality of life. Maybe an example would be removal of a tumor that's compressing the spinal column, and now they don't have weakness in one side or they're not incontinent of their bowels. That's one example, or even pain relief. We can also use surgery to assess therapy's effectiveness, such as maybe doing a cystoscopy or um, bronchoscopy maybe even laparoscopy, where we will look inside the abdomen and see if any of the tumor is still there. Lastly, reconstructive surgery. Maybe this can be a breast surgery or a rhinoplasty if somebody had head or neck cancer. The example I have down there is somebody who has testicular cancer and they put in a silicone prosthetic. And just FYI, my next picture is graphic. There you go. So looking on the right here, 
we have multiple types of surgery that they are probably doing. They initially are starting off with cure. So they are going to be cutting all of those off. And then they're going to move to reconstructive, as you see in picture two and three. I'm actually pointing to the one on the right. That's what is considered reconstructive. <clears throat> Here on the left, we actually have an example of them developing a flap. We will insert these saline bags into and under a patient's skin and muscle. And then every so many weeks, you will inject into that saline bag. Usually the doctor does this more and more saline. This is going to expand the tissue, making a lot of extra tissue for them to take and relocate around somebody's chest. When the time is right, the bags are cut out and then that muscle is going to be then looped around to somebody's chest and they're going to insert an implant right there. And now we have, voila, reconstructive surgery all the way done. And these are some other options in case somebody does not want their back done. These are some basic interventions that honestly you would probably do for anybody who is having surgery. Um, you know, surgery for our cancer patients can occur sometimes within days of their diagnosis. So things are going to be happening really quickly and they may not have time to process it. So teach with caution because they may not be receptive to you or they may. It just depends. Please provide accurate information especially about scarring and disfigurement and any kind of changes in lifestyle. This is an example of a patient who she had lung cancer. She's very young, but she was pretty persistent and wanting to get married. And so they were able to modify her lifestyle, such as putting her in a wheelchair with portable oxygen so she could do the things that she wanted to do. Okay, when it comes to uh, some specific things that we should consider for a cancer patient, we want to make sure physical therapy is involved, especially if somebody's had a radical mastectomy. Radical means they took muscle, the tumor, the breast tissue, and lots of lymph nodes. Physical therapy is very important for somebody who's had this procedure because of the complication called lymphatic cording or axillary web syndrome. And this is where the tendons there will tighten up and actually prevent somebody's full range of motion. So what do we do? We can call physical therapy and they're going to help prevent this syndrome with stretching, flexibility exercises, and range of motion exercises. And they usually will teach this to the patient before breast cancer surgery and reinforce it afterward. And we also will help reinforce these exercises. Speech therapy is also important for people who have head or neck cancer. And with all of the radiation and all of the surgery, they're going to have a really hard time uh, talking, chewing, eating. Speech therapy is the personnel for that. Uh, occupational therapy. The occupational therapist can help if anybody needs, say, um, energy conser conservation techniques. Maybe they need help in promoting self-care or doing their own ADLs. They are a great resource that I see often up on the floor when I was uh, working up there. And last but not least, the really uncomfortable topic of sex, especially if, say, somebody had a colon uh, cancer and they had to have a resection and now they have an ostomy, I would make sure to reach out and contact a sex therapist. Of course, please make sure your patient wants one. That would probably be important. Another option exists if we want to try to control or if we want to try to cure cancer, and that is by the use of radiation therapy. 
The goal of radiation therapy is to destroy cancer cells with minimum damaging effects to the surrounding normal tissue. We oftentimes will combine radiation with say chemotherapy or we can combine it with surgery to actually maximize tumor kill and limit damage to the normal cells. Well, what is radiation? Radiation is actually when we take a lot of energy, concentrated energy, and we're gonna pass it through the body into the cells where it should, it should impose excessive energy that the cells are actually not equipped to handle and it's gonna cause chaos. And chaos in a bad cell is a good thing because now the cell can't function and replicate. <clears throat> We are actually going to make sure to give radiation on a daily basis for a particular set of time, such as like 10 minutes or 15 minutes. And the reason we do this is it actually is going to allow for greater destruction of cancer cells and it's going to reduce the damage to the normal cells rather than zapping everything with a high dose at once. Now cells will die outright from radiation or they're going to become unable to divide. The absorption rate of the radiation is different for all cells. So the dividing are gonna actually divide, die quicker. Let me rephrase that. Cells die outright from radiation or become unable to divide. The absorption rate of radiation is different for all cells. So those that are dividing um, at that moment are gonna die quicker. The way that the radiation oncologist is going to prescribe this radiation, he is going to uh, write the dose in grays. Grays depend on the tumor size and the location plus the tissue sensitivity level. So it could be 7 grays or it could be 20 grays. The picture down below is intensive intensity modulated radiation therapy. So it's a certain type of radiation therapy. Not important to know, I just wanted to explain my picture. When we look at the two major types of radiation, we have teletherapy and brachytherapy. In teletherapy, the patient is not radioactive in any way, shape, or form. There is a external source of radiation that is gonna be passed to them uh, into their tissues. What's important to know is the location of the tumor first. And then once they know this from maybe a CT scan, an MRI, or a PET scan, they are actually gonna mark the site with these semi-permanent tattoos in my first picture, or they're gonna actually put a sticker, as you can see with the X. Please do not remove the sticker and don't try to rub these tattoos off. They need to stay there. In the event of, say, radiation needs to be uh, sent to the brain, then we don't want to tattoo or sticker their face up. We're actually going to make a mold of their face and then we're going to apply and remove the mold uh, or this fiberglass splint, I should say and it's gonna have all of the markings on it. So we know exactly where to go, right? Now, brachytherapy. This is a little different in that the patient is gonna come into direct contact with a radiation source. Isotopes, these radioactive isotopes, are either given by um, IV or PO by a nuclear medicine technician. So the radiation source is now the patient, meaning that the patient is a hazard to others and to us. It is important to know if they received an uh, unsealed or sealed type of radiation treatment because the unsealed kind are usually ingested or it's injected IV and the sealed kind is actually going to be a little bit more, well sometimes it could be permanent such as the seeding that you see down below that is the size of a penny, and they're going to seed the prostate. If we have temporary sealed radiation, this will be usually uh, 
held in place by a device such as in cervical cancer where they are going to take this apparatus it's going to hold the radioactive material and it's going to be pushed and be in contact with the cervix now just so you know a patient if they have the unsealed type of radiation like I-131 the items that they touch because it's in all of their excreta the radioactive isotopes are going to be in their sweat their tears their urine their feces their saliva all items that they touch have to decay before they get discharged I will say that now more and more patients are actually taking the radioactive isotope and going home and then they will be in their home environment and they cannot be near others while the radioactive material is decaying they are most dangerous I should say in the first 24 to 48 hours after ingestion or injection This is a lovely little example of a care map for somebody who's receiving radiation. It has the two different types, and then it has not only the two main types, but then it breaks it down even further from the solid to the liquid. I'll let you take a look at that. But I always recommend students make something like this to help them better understand the material. I want to clarify something just real quick like when I said items need to decay in the room what I really mean is the radioactive isotopes that are produced in the saliva and sweat and every other bodily excreta they actually need to decay as in lose their energy so they're not harmful to anybody else that comes in contact with it so that's what I mean by decay okay now to the side effects of radiation therapy we're going to have um, some local and some uh, systemic things, acute and long-term side effects. So it really depends which organ you are radiating, uh, applying the radiation to. The colon and the uterus are considered more sensitive than the breast and the lung tissue. We're going to see skin changes and hair changes. Um, such as a loss of hair. This is considered a local side effect. However, if the dose, the total dose of radiation is higher, we can actually have permanent hair loss. Now, a patient is going to get altered taste sensation regardless of the radiation site. So they're going to complain that things taste bad and have a particular aversion to red meat. We do hear complaints that the fatigue is debilitating and can last from months to a year after the radiation therapy has stopped. The picture I have here is of a cutaneous injury caused by radiation to treat advanced lung cancer with metastasis to the head and spine. This sort of illustrates the radiation burns to the head and to the neck region. Now, what is all that white stuff? That is actually residual silver sulfazid. I'm going to mess this word up. Sulfadiazine, right? Sulfur sulfadiazine and um, maffinide acetate cream, which is basically burn cream that has been applied to the patient's face and ears. It has that white color to it. We're trying to treat the injury, injury and prevent infectious complications. Now, when it comes to secondary malignancies, um, unfortunately, a patient who has radiation to the bone can also develop maybe 10, 15, 20 years down the road, uh, malig the malignancies such as leukemia or lymphoma. Now, please note that not all patients have the same side effects and it really depends on the organ, it's being radiated, the dose, it has a lot of different factors, but do know that it can go from mild to extreme. Well, how are we going to best care for this patient? Skin care is your probably number one priority. 
the skin will definitely dry and break down. Now, there is no evidence based, there's no hardcore protocol of what should be done for patients who have skin breakdown related to radiation. However, if you go to the Oncology Nursing Society website, I love how they have things broken down into three different colors. They have what is recommended, they have there is effectiveness, but it's not really been established interventions. And if you look down there, they have red, sort of like a stoplight, um, not recommended for practice. So patients should not try aloe vera as an example for their radiation burns. This is going to be having the opposite effect of their skin. No soothing there. We tell our patients to follow their radiation oncologist's recommendations for the use and the timing of products. Here's my first option there. Encourage your person to wash their body with their hand, not a cloth, not a loofah, no nothing. So put the soap on their hand and scrub. They need to avoid the sun or excessive heat for about one year after treatment. Their skin will be very sensitive and painful. Encourage your patients to pat when they are bathing themselves and don't scrub. And that could go even if they had an itch. Please pat the area, don't scrub. Speaking of itching, they need to avoid scratchy clothes and anything else that would be a skin irritant. We do not recommend that patients buy over-the-counter lotions. However, oftentimes the physician will uh, prescribe some kind of unscented lotion. Okay, so when it comes to xerostoma, uh, stomia, this can be, uh, that's fancy for dry mouth, and we're gonna see this with head and neck cancer. This is due to the radiation damaging the salivary glands. Why this is a problem is because we're gonna have tooth decay and we're gonna need some extra dental visits, not to mention we're gonna have trouble chewing and swallowing our food. We recommend, because patients often report fatigue, that they get um, a lot of sleep and low impact exercise has been shown to help with fatigue. Depending upon if they're getting radiation to a bone site, their bone fracture risk can be increased. So please initiate fall precautions for this patient. Well, what about us? How do we make sure we are not affected by the radiation? Great question. It honestly kind of depends. If they have the unsealed isotope, such as something that was injected or ingested, we wanna make sure to double flush all of the toilets Techs are not allowed to go in this room. It is strictly a nurse's responsibility to take care of anything and everything in that room. We are gonna encourage the person to saran wrap their personal items, like their cell phone or their keyboard. Reason being is if their radiation uh, levels inside them have gone down, then we can actually go ahead and discharge them sooner by just taking off the saran wrap and now they can have their personal items. We're probably going to avoid, uh, well, I actually have it down there. Let me get there. All right, for a person who has a sealed implant, their excreta is not radioactive. However, we do need to use a portable lead shield. We need to use a portable lead shield so we are not being affected by the radiation that's being emitted by them or their device, really. A radioactive material caution sign should be placed outside the door. The nurse must always wear an individual dosimeter, or some people say dosometer, whatever your, fits your fancy. Visitors need to be um, only there for about 30 minutes per day, and pregnant women and children younger than 16 are not allowed. And this is usually for the sealed folks. However, they do oftentimes impose a restriction for unsealed um, radiation as well. We're going to talk about six feet away from the person behind the lead shield, right? And that actually is a great example right here of what their room looks like. I don't know if you can see that bottom picture. 
<laughs> they've actually covered the floor as well. And we don't ever want to touch the radioactive source with bare hands. This right here is an example of a lead pig. It's basically a canister that if the, say, sealed device becomes dislodged, maybe a person is wiggly and it comes out of the circuit cervix and falls on the floor, please pick it up with forceps and place it in the pig and call the physician. That is a patient safety hazard to them and, well, actually to you. Okay, we are going to save the garbage, the linens, and the utensils, etc., until the Geiger counter can actually read safe levels of radiation. Mm -hmm. If a person is recovering at home, you're going to encourage them to do the same, but for their linens, they are actually going to wash them twice and three times for every load in case they sweat it on them or something. And utensils, um, if they are non-disposable, like silver, real silverware, then they wash them in the dishwasher several times. Do not share utensils, no.